early days here on YouTube, I did a little four-part series on Pelagianism and asking some questions, making some points. Uh, needless to say, the Pelagians uh, were completely unable to uh, deal with my uh, arguments. I am um, basically just redoing them. Uh, I actually probably will shorten them. And I'm going to try, I have five questions for the Pelagians, or five, at least five points I want to make, and I would like some answers. Let's see if this time around I have uh, quite a bit more uh, subscribers than I did back then. Um, and let's see uh, if the Pelagians can uh, step up. Uh, so anyways, let's get to it. Uh, the first one, Pelagianism teaches that, <clears throat> and unfortunately even you know, Arminians uh, teach this as well, uh, that babies are innocent. They have no sin whatsoever. Uh, they, uh, there's no original sin. There is no imputed guilt from Adam, anything like that. They are completely free of sin in every way, shape, or form. If that is true, then why did God destroy babies during the flood? God brought the flood because there was none righteous outside of Noah and his family. Those were the only eight people that found favor in the eyes of God. Everybody else on earth was deemed as wicked, corrupt, and evil. So if, if clearly there was infants, there were babies during the time of the flood. Hundreds of thousands, millions, depends on how many people actually lived back then, but there would have been a lot. Now, why did God say everybody but no one in his family were wicked? There was clearly infants on the earth. Why did he judge them along with everybody else if they were innocent? Why didn't he give them a boat ticket? Now, if you say, if you still want to argue that they were innocent, then you're going to run into another problem. That being, they were judged based on the sins of others. In other words, the judgment, the flood, came upon those innocent children because of the sins of other people. But that's something you guys don't hold to. You don't believe in people being judged or held accountable or responsible for the sins or behavior of others. So could you please answer this? Why did God kill all those innocent babies if they were truly innocent and we could also carry this into Sodom and Gomorrah as well same line of argumentation uh, they couldn't even find ten righteous within Sodom and Gomorrah you're telling me there weren't ten infants between the two cities there were there was not a total of ten infants between the two cities ten righteous okay in Pelagian thought Theoretically, it is possible for a person to live sinless, perfectly sinless, from conception to death. It is theoretically possible in their theological system. Okay? Romans 3 tells us that there are none righteous, there are none good, there are none that seek after God. Okay? So clearly... Paul's words, at the time that he wrote that, there was no righteous person. Everybody was a sinner. Okay? So, no question, Paul's words were true 2,000 years ago. There, was, there were no righteous people. There were no sinless people. But in Pelagian theology, it is theoretically possible to, to live a sinless life. So I ask you, are Paul's words still true today? When we read Romans 3, <clears throat> and Paul says, there are none righteous, there are none good, there are none who seek after God, are his words true today? Let me ask you this. Will Paul's words be true 10 years from now? Will Paul's words be true 1,000 years from now? If his words remain true, were true then, are true today, and will remain true on into the future, then it is not theoretically possible for man, any man to live 
a sinless life. It's not. If you believe that it is theoretically possible for man to live sinless, then you also believe that it is theoretically possible to prove God a liar. Because if man, if, for instance, today, if someone lived a perfect life today, okay, you know, they were born 50 years ago and, you know, and they, they died 20 years from now, and they lived a perfect life, then Paul's words would be untrue. They would be false. And that's the word of God. Could you please answer that for me? <clears throat> now, on to point three or question three. We are taught in the Old Testament and also the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. We are told that there is a sacrifice in the Old Testament. There is a sacrifice for the sins committed in ignorance. Okay? And in Hebrews, we are told the same thing. It is confirmed uh, that the high priest offered up a sacrifice for the sins done in ignorance. Now, I ask you, Pelagians, <clears throat> have you ever committed a sin in ignorance? Have you ever committed a sin without knowing you committed a sin? You see, in your theology, Christ you, you have to repent. You have to know of your particular sins and repent of them because Christ did not die for your future sins unless you repent of them. Right? You have to know it, confess it, and repent of it. How do you repent of a sin that you don't know that you committed? See, you guys, you, you, you have put yourselves in a very uh, curious situation here. If you have ever committed a sin in ignorance, that means you have not confessed it, you haven't repented of it, which means Christ has not forgiven you for it, which means you're on your way to hell. Answer that for me, please. It's very often that <clears throat> the Pelagians will want to argue with the Calvinists about limited atonement, limited atonement. Christ died for everybody. He died for every single person. Adam to Zelda. But wait a minute. The Bible says that Christ died for sinners. Right? We'll agree. Christ died for sinners. But yet, you don't believe everyone's a sinner. You believe babies are innocent. They have not sinned. And if a baby dies in infancy, they died sinless. Which means Christ did not die for them because Christ died for sinners. So Pelagianism teaches a form of limited atonement. Does it not? If Christ died for sinners and babies are sinless, they never, the ones that die, they never grow up to sin. They never grow old. They die in a sinless state. Then Christ did not die for them. So you have your own form of limited atonement. And so I need you to respond to that. And I would also like you to uh, explain how is it there can be two ways of salvation. The Bible says there's only one way of salvation. That's through Jesus Christ. There's only one way. But if you're sinless, you don't need Jesus. Okay? So you're promoting two ways of salvation. Works, that is, be sinless, and through Jesus Christ. It's two ways of salvation. The Bible says there's only one way. So why do you promote two ways? And for my last point or question, are you being disciplined by the Lord? That is the Pelagian. Are you being disciplined by the Lord? If you say yes, then you admit to being a sinner. 
If you say no, then you admit to being an illegitimate son, which means you're not a Christian. So which is it? You see, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 4 through 8, <clears throat> tells us, well, let me read it. It says, in your struggle against sin, and the author's uh, writing to believers, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, notice they are sons of God here. Um, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, then you are an illegitimate child and not true sons. So if you're sinless, there's no need for discipline. But yet Hebrews says if you're not being disciplined, then you're not a son. You're illegitimate. And notice, again, the sinless perfection, Pelagian heresy that teaches if you're sinning, you're not a Christian. But yet Hebrews says they're sons of God. As a matter of fact, it says he loves them. As a matter of fact, the discipline is a sign of his love. And if they're sinless, then why is he disciplining them? Could you please answer this for me? Again, I had this series up before, about a year ago. And the Pelagians couldn't answer. As a matter of fact, uh, Fractal Fires came around and he danced around the, uh, my objections, my points that I made. Uh, Fractal Fires, I mean, he even says right here, <clears throat> you forget that your points are worth ignoring. My conscience and my love for God and my neighbor demand that I ignore them. Your points are full of, I don't even know what that word is. And you are merely envious of the influence God is giving me to others, so you want more viewers. I am confident that my beliefs are apostolic and that of the early church, regardless of your selfishly motivated crusade, to keep others away from it. In other words, Fractal Fires watched my videos and he could not come up with a response. So what did he do? Your points are just not worth responding to. Translation, I have no answer, Chris. I cannot respond to this because you've proven my theology to be wrong. That's the translation of what he said. So Pelagians, please step up, answer my questions. I have more, but <clears throat> I don't think these five are going to get dealt with. So there's no point in laying out 10 or 20. Try to answer these five. And as the Arminians and Pelagians would say, good luck. <laughs>